Welcome everyone. Today, Benza Warrior Community is excited to welcome Jacob Ressler to our Zoom roundtable. Jake is gonna tell us about his experience coping with his own withdrawal and his research on linkages between trauma and protracted, protracted withdrawal. Um, and he's going to do that in some prepared remarks, which we're going to record, after which we're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back with a discussion for all of us here, which Jake is going to lead because he is very much interested in what all of you have to say. Jacob Bressler is a licensed social worker with an MSW concentration in mental health and addictions from Indiana University and is certified by the University of Maryland to practice critical incident stress management. Building on his MSW and two prior degrees in disaster management, he's currently working on a PhD in social work focused on the disaster field. However, Jacob's cur Jake is currently using an academic opportunity to conduct a research study on the relationship between pre-benzo trauma and post-benzo pause or bind. In addition to being a full-time student, working full-time as a researcher and a data analyst and coping with three teen stepdaughters, Jake is a moderator for the um, Reddit Benzo Recovery Community. And through that subreddit has hosted a weekly Zoom support group for people at all stages of recovery from benzo use for the past two years. So having worked through significant trauma and presently approaching his fourth year of recovery from benzo benzo dependency and the subsequent injury forced by a rapid taper, Jacob has significant lived experience with multiple types of recovery. Jake, welcome to Benzo Warrior and thanks so much for coming today. We're glad to see you. There we go. I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess that kind of knocks out my first slide because uh, it's pretty much all that same stuff. <laughs> So we're going to save a couple minutes. It's going to be great. Um, so I, I, we will talk a little bit about trauma at the end, but this is primarily um, lessons that I have learned, st strategies for navigating uh, the recovery road um, over my experience, um, which I think has been unique, having been a culmination of personal experience and uh, lessons from members of the support group that I, I'm a host for uh, and have been for a couple of years, um, you, know, met, you know, stories from the, the members of the subreddit that I'm a moderator on, which, you know, we got about 45,000 people in there, um, and also from um, my about 20 years as a Holocaust scholar as well. Um, so there's been a lot of resilience lessons learned. Um, so this is, I have managed to live life uh, through this process, um, and so this is largely about what I have found got me through that. Which we'll find out in just a moment. Okay, so I don't really need to go through all this again because we already did that. So where did, well, I'll tell you a little bit about my, my benzo history, and I won't I won't you know beat this thing too badly because uh, I think just about everybody is pretty familiar with how this works. Um, my story in particular, though, 2014, I lost a loved one in a mass shooting because uh, this is the United States, and that happens. Um, that left me in a period of very dark, deep isolation um, where I did not process the experience as I should have. Um, and so over time, that led me down the road to PTSD, um, unfortunately. So in 2017, uh, I started having some panic attacks, a couple panic attacks, not, not, you know, not, not a daily thing. Um, I hadn't had an anxiety disorder previously, but those few panic attacks led me to some sleep issues uh, that ultimately brought me into having a clonopin prescription. Um, for a few years, I felt pretty good. Um, I ended up traveling to Kenya. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, she and I went to Kenya visiting my sister. We ended up getting engaged there. Uh, that was a really important piece of kind of moving me on with um, moving me out of some of the PTSD stuff, uh, which pushed me to decide to go to grad school. So I started working towards my MSW. Um, but, you know, I was on Bonapin at that point and felt all right. Um, 2020 hit and that was um, 2020 was a big year for everybody. Um, for me, in addition to COVID and lockdowns and all that fun jazz that we all remember real well. Um, it um, 
was the point in time when I hit tolerance. Um, so in that, that may, um, just things didn't feel right. Uh, started having more of the, the panicky stuff, what, lots of just, just things that I couldn't explain, which I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, didn't know what was causing that. So I decided I would just get rid of all the stuff I was taking. Um, and so in June, I decided that it was, it was time to part ways with it. I knew that I was going to need to either increase it or, uh, drop it. So I decided to, you know, go to my provider and say, this is what I want to do. And they said, well, I'm going to be gone in about two weeks. We're retiring. So we will connect you with another psychiatrist and you could take it up with them. So I did. And I was lucky. I got in there quick there. You know, there's a, there's a long wait, uh, to be able to get to see somebody else. This person, unfortunately, it came around uh, July when we met and they informed me that I was, I would have one month to taper off, uh, yeah, about four weeks to get off. Um, there was no way around it. It was that or cold turkey because there was nobody else that I could see in a reasonable amount of time that would be able to, um, you know, help, help me to process this in a better way. The truth is I didn't really know what I was doing anyway. Um, so with no other recourse, uh, you know, we got to August and that that real quick taper ended um, and I was pushed on to gabapentin to mitigate seizures as you know lots of people are um, and it's a pretty classic story from there um, so we will look at what that story looks like that picture is me about six months in um, real weathered um, <laughs> not feeling good at that point uh, at all and that's an understatement um, so the nature of that saga, you know, acute was, I would, I would say it was towards the bad end of typical, um, you know, recognizing there's some people that get real lucky and they just, they just cruise on through. I was not one of them. Um, I was fortunate to have not experienced ecthesia. I, I skipped benzo belly, you know, some of, some of those, some of those real notorious ones. Um, I didn't end up having to experience myself, but I got a whole lot of the other stuff. Um, and you know, that was, that was challenging, but I was fortunate by some of the circumstances, uh, you know, COVID had hit. So as a silver lining on COVID, uh, my classes were all virtual at the time. So, whereas I had been told you'll be fine in a couple of weeks after this brief taper, what do you know? That was not the case. Um, so, you know, I ended up having to do my classes online, which was real lucky because I just had to go from the bed to the computer. Um, and try to keep plugging away at, you know, my classes, my assignments. Um, I, I'm i not really quite sure how I managed to pull that off, uh, but I, I managed to, to keep at it. Um, while doing that, you know, I was unable to drive really more than like five, 10 minutes. Um, and at the same time, we've got three kids in the house that are doing e-learning. Uh, my wife was at the time, um, you know, she was uh, working in her office you know, elsewhere. So it was me and three kids doing e-learning here while I'm in withdrawal in my acute phase, while I'm also trying to navigate grad school. It was a lot. It was a real lot for a while there. Um, so for the first three months, I really was just kind of stumbling around. I uh, didn't, didn't really know anything about what was going on. I'm like, well, they told me it was two weeks. That's not true. So I don't know what to think at this point. Uh, I didn't know who to trust. I didn't know who to talk to. Um, like many people, I, I kind of fumbled my way into Benzo Buddies, uh, and that was the, probably what I would say is the typical experience. Um, I found some really good information there. Um, I also found some things that terrified me, um, but I, I found a, some kind of a community. Um, and before long, I ended up stumbling into the uh, the, so the Benzo Recovery subreddit, um, and that that really just kind of clicked as kind of a home home people um, because there was the, the response rates are so fast. I wasn't on Facebook at that point. I hadn't been on Facebook in at that point, seven years. Um, so Reddit was, you know, became kind of the, the home base for like getting information, getting support, getting contact. Um, but it was pretty isolated. There was no, there was no support group in particular. There was no zoom group or anything like that, but I did learn some really important information. Um, I got to the point where I was dealing with this for a year and it was, it was evident that things were not just going to end fast. Um, so I realized that I, I needed to make some radical changes and push myself to do some things. So I tried to harness a lot of the lessons that I had learned. Um, and we will be getting into those lessons and strategies. Um, so despite Benzo Recovery, using 
the lessons that I had learned. Um, you know, I I was dealing with, you know, depersonalization, derealization, insomnia, panic, nerve pain, brain fog, you know, agoraphobia, monophobia, pending doom, all the stuff, um, you know, off and on in different waves and not all at once, but, you know, with different combos and different flavors of it. Um, you know, I'd rolled into some of the more consistent pause or bind symptoms. Um, and, um, sorry, I got to One second. Okay. Um, so I also had been dealing with gabapentin withdrawal for about three years. Um, you know, it, it, it was it was pretty consistent. Um, so at this point, you know, I have stayed in school. Uh, I completed a couple internships. I managed to get my MSW with honors. I ended up going back to Kenya. We got married there. Um, I got hit by a wave the day before the wedding, which you know, of course, that's going to happen. Uh, as it as it would. Um, I got accepted into a PhD program. I started doing the coursework. You know, that meant having to drive a couple hours every week. Um, but things had changed enough that I was able to push. And it was I had some hard. I have have had some real rough trips <laughs> from from the campus to home. Uh, but just it just I had to do it. I had to live. Um, you know, I've had some articles published. Uh, I've done spoken at some conferences. I won some awards, and the reality is that it was extremely hard to accomplish those things. Um, I'm not a particularly special person, um, but I have had the advantage of learning some extremely valuable lessons that I was able to put into practice that really made an incredible difference in what I was able to do during that time. And to some, to some degree, continue to live my life um, despite some really awful stuff. Um, you know, and, and those things, as I said before, came, came predominantly from, you know, uh, my own personal experiences, work with the support group, which, you know, at that point, it, as of now, it has been almost exactly two years, uh, and community moderation, and then, you know, the, the Holocaust research. So let's dig into the strategies. Um, let's see. Strategy number one. Know your enemy. Um, and subtle hint, your enemy is Amy. Um, so Amy is your amygdala and is your primary recovery nemesis. Uh, Amy loves benzos and will do just about anything to try to get back on benzos. Um, to break you and get you there, Amy will weaponize everything, everything possible. All the past traumas, the fears, the regrets, the insecurities, shame, guilt, all of that stuff gets brought back to the surface. Even if you forgot about it, Amy didn't forget because there are memory imprints with those emotions and Amy brings them back. Um, Amy then will project those very unpleasant things from your past through the lens of your current suffering to predict a catastrophic future of crises and suffering. Um, that's not rooted in reality, but is extremely manipulative for a reason. So the issues with uh, panic, impending doom, the nightmares, those are all Amy weapons. Uh, those inner whispers of you're not normal, you can't do this, you're too weak, others are stronger than you, you'll never heal. That's all Amy. That is all intentional manipulation from your amygdala. Uh, Amy takes what matters the most and will invert that to become your deepest fear. So for example, uh, if you are someone who, if you're a parent and you have just loved your kids like so much, it's like the biggest thing in your life. It has always been like your passion. I'm going to go ahead and guess if that, if that is the case, then you have had one is one of your biggest fears that you are failing as a parent and ruining your kid's childhood. Because Amy does that, takes the things that you care about the most, the things that matter the most and turns them into something that is soul crushing. Even if it's not reflective of reality, it still uses a weapon. Um, but if you flip that back around in those moments and think about what are those things that you are feeling, that tells you a lot about who you really are because somebody who's a bad parent don't really care about damaging their kids. They don't really obsess over wanting to avoid doing that. And the fact that you are experiencing that really says a lot about what your heart really is. So that's just a little side note. Um, so question then is, you know, how do we use the strategy? Um, 
the good news is that Amy's weapons can be disarmed. Um, it's not easy and it's not fast, but it does come with time. Um, one of the best things to do is when you realize that you're experiencing an Amy manipulation or having that thought in the back of your head of like, this is never going to end, you're weak, call it out. Call it out out loud. And you're going to look silly if there's other people around, but that doesn't matter. Because calling it out and speaking it gives you power recognizing where this is coming from. Because so much of this stuff is rooted in the fear of the unknown. We don't know why these thoughts are happening. We don't know why we're having intrusive thoughts. We don't know why we're having these nightmares. We don't know why we're having these awful ideas and thoughts. But most of the time, in almost every case, it's actually Amy. So if you can trace that back and call that out, there's a lot of power in that. Uh, and saying it out loud manifests it in a more real way for you. Um, so when the, you know, the negative self-talk, the intrusive thoughts, ruminations start to spiral, say it out loud. You are on to Amy's shady tricks. Um, it takes so much of the sting out of it. It really does. Um, and it's not an immediate effect. But eventually, you can you have the ability to just kind of let it roll off your shoulders. Um, because he's just like, ah, oh, Amy's at it again. Come on. You can, it, it almost just becomes a nuisance uh, rather than something that's soul rattling and terrifying, which is a pretty big deal. Um, you can also, in that process, learn to coexist with it, uh, which is not fun. It's not a fun idea at all, but it's a powerful one. Um, being able to learn to objectively sit with that unpleasantness can help to normalize the, the ebb and flow of symptoms, uh, and that can give you the ability to observe how those patterns evolve. Uh, and how you can do better at letting them go. And we're going to get into some mindfulness stuff. That's a big, that, that's going to come up a bunch. Uh, but that's a key part of mindfulness is being able to sit with the discomfort and just let it, let it be without controlling you. Um, another really important thing to do is to bring it all back to the present. Um, Present-centered mindfulness is a really, really crucial way to stop aiming. Um, and that can be intentional breathing, that can be mindfulness exercises that we'll get into. Um, those things all help to put Amy back in place. Um, and as time goes on, you eventually, like I said, get to kind of see that they're, they're really just super obnoxious. You get, but you see the patterns and it's not something that is a real threat. Move on to strategy number two. Strategy number two is be here now. And it's it's not just in the large philosophical sense. Be here now, mindful and present. Um, mindfulness is the practice of being here now, turning everything else in the universe, tuning it out, and you know whatever's not part of your immediate focus and your immediate self now is not relevant in that moment. And that's that's a challenging art for a lot of people to master, um, but it's a really invaluable asset, um, especially as then you're working to successfully navigate the recovery process. Um, mindfulness practices pretty effectively put Amy in place by concentrating on your body in this exact present moment. So like we said, you know, Amy likes to manipulate your perception of time, how the past influences the future through the present. None of that needs to happen. Bring it all back to right here, right now to to pinpoint accuracy um, not not five minutes in the future not you know five hours not five weeks five months five years now right now in this moment uh, and so we'll talk about body scanning and stuff like that in a little bit um, several weeks of this is an important point though several weeks of mindfulness practice particularly you know among the meditation forms um, i'm a huge fan of yoga nidra um, doing that for several weeks uh, can improve emotional baseline by lowering the amygdala's agitation and that then calms anxiety, enables central nervous system healing uh, through decreased neuroinflammation and increased neuroplasticity. Those are really important concepts. Um, and ultimately, it can be an incredibly powerful and really epic tool to halt panic attacks. And I've used that myself. You know, in class, once my classes were finally back in person, you know, I'm still I'm still feeling this stuff, and I feel a panic attack rising, and I just could revert into this body scanning mode and just pin the panic attack down. It takes some mastery, but when you have it, it's really, really powerful. Um, so, you know, that that mindfulness, the mindfulness practices are huge. Um, so how do we use this? Um, virtually all forms of meditation are mindfulness practices. Like I said, yoga nidra is one of my absolute favorites. Uh, 
it's you know it's 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 the the yogic sleep um i'm not getting paid to say it but the the saravara yoga channel on youtube has been a huge asset for me um so you can also practice mindful breathing like belly breathing box breathing five seven eight breathing um alternate nose method breathing um you can practice grounding can and should practice grounding exercises uh body scanning the five senses you know five four three two one method humming a song is a grounding exercise um you can practice mindful movement with yoga or tai chi um consciously produce artwork of any kind that's intentful um you know and not just kind of passive for me that's collage uh, but that act of you know using using an exacto and cutting cutting along fine lines on an image is zeroing in every every piece and every ounce of my awareness into that pinpoint in the universe and it's incredibly cathartic um because all that other stuff is is not it's not in the air awareness. It's just right here, right now. Um, spending time immersed in nature conscientiously, you know, being aware of your surroundings and really savoring nature uh, is a really great tactic. Um, we can also use tech resources. We, we've got, we're doing it right now. We all have access to it. Use that to your advantage. There's lots of apps like the Dare app, the Calm app. There's lots of these things, some paid, some not, but there are a lot of great resources. Uh, that can be used to be able to navigate some of this stuff. With that, we will move on to the next strategy. And that's to listen to your body, um, which I think seems natural, but isn't oftentimes for us. Um, so in recovery, especially, you know, you're experiencing all all kinds of like new stuff and a lot of it's not pleasant it's a whole new form of self-awareness when there's a lot of intense changes happening um so challenging yourself um is an important part for you know an important element in growth um but it's also sometimes really important to know when to say no like i can't do this right now not now um, because pushing too hard or letting other people push you be you know whether that's in a work situation or a family situation but leaving yourself open to being compelled beyond your limits can have outcomes that can range from counterproductive to dangerous, um, depending on what your situation is. And that's especially true when you're tapering. Um, you know, we, within these communities, we keep having to say over and over, just slow it down. If you have the ability to go slow, go slow. Some people, I mean, myself included, didn't really have that choice. But if you do have the option, you know, your body's going to tell you if you're moving too fast. Uh, and listening to those indicators are far more important than a timetable uh, or, you know, a, a schedule. You know, listening to what your body's actually saying. Um, and that includes, you know, listening to your gut, listening to your inf intuition. You know, listening to your body is an incredibly important part of becoming more empowered, optimizing recovery, and uh, preventing further injury or burnout. So how do we do this? Uh, exercise and mindfulness. It's back. Um, you know, body scanning, such a great method for learning to listen to your body. Uh, check in with yourself on a daily basis. Um, you know, you can, even when you're feeling awful, what kind of awful is this? What, how, is this a normal awful that I'm feeling right now? Note the discomfort, the tension, fatigue, you know, especially if they're out of the relative norm and try to, you know, what, what might be triggering these things? Pay attention to the eating, to your eating and hydration patterns, um, you know, including like what you're consuming, how often you're consuming it, because your body is going to communicate what it needs. We, we tend to notice that when we're thirsty, but we don't notice it some other times because we're generally not listening. Um, prioritize rest and relaxation to the best of your ability. Not everybody is able to do that, unfortunately, but to whatever extent you can, prioritize rest and relaxation. Um, this is a situation that needs to take it easy. Um, exhaustion and stress worsen symptoms and ultimately slow healing. Exercise is great, but exercise intuitively and in some moderation. Um, you know, too much intensity increases oxygen in the brain that can cause symptom spikes. Uh, it's a common complaint, part of the debate, why some people say I can't exercise and other people say you have to exercise. Well, it's a, kind of largely about how you're exercising. Um, but ultimately some exercise is better than no exercise. And in the end, just listen to your gut, literally. You're, you can, you're, the gut has an incredible ability to communicate with you. We don't know how to listen to it very well, 
But if you can listen to do that, you can learn an incredible amount about yourself. Next strategy, allow yourself to grieve. This is a tough one for a lot of people, um, especially people who are dealing with a long taper or a long withdrawal process, or they're you know, stuck with pause or bind. Um, it's pretty natural to experience the grief cycle. You know, that's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, um, but not in any particular order or some things are repeated over multiple times. Um, you know, experiencing potentially potentially traumatic change, you know, the loss of your capacities, uh, disrupted plans, altered relational dynamics, uh, loss of sense of self, you know, all really trigger a lot of the grief responses and can feel a lot like losing a loved one. Um, feeling that grief, feeling it, really feeling it is super normal. Um, and with it, you know, we need to normalize the indicators that come with it. Crying, anger, regret, shock, confusion, depression. You know, express those things without shame. Don't worry about, you know, what somebody thinks. You know, if you're in a support group and you're feeling that grief and you just really need to cry, then cry. Just do it. Your body is telling you something important. Just do it. And you know, if you're in a leadership position, encourage that. Don't let other people, you know, put that down because that's important. That's an important element of the healing. Um, you know, you need to let the grief run its course is what it comes down to. Expressing that and letting the grief work itself out. Um, and you don't rush it. You can't rush grief. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> you just, you, you set yourself back by doing that. But at the same time, while not rushing it, be cautious that you don't fall into a trap of wallowing within that, because that can also be uh, very problematic. Um, pursue the healing, pursue that, but let it work in its own time, but keep the goal in mind. So how do we do that? What's the strategy? Um, acknowledge feelings and recognize that the feelings are normal and valid, whether that's for yourself or for someone that you know is experiencing this. Um, find healthy ways to express it, you know, like communication with loved ones or a therapist, Write it out, write, 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 write it out. Write what you're feeling or any other kind of creative expression. It could be art, music, express it, feel it. Um, do not isolate. I learned that one the hard way myself. Don't isolate, connect with people, that, especially the people that you care about and people that you know care about you and who can relate to what you're experiencing. Support groups are huge for that so that you aren't lost in the experience. Um, Allow yourself the time that you need and just be kind to yourself in the process. You know, don't beat yourself up for feeling grief. That's, that, it doesn't do anything good for anybody and it only makes it hurt more and takes longer. A uh, great way to do this is to create rituals um, or symbols that celebrate the things that you feel you have lost. I'd say, I don't say the things you have lost, but the things that you feel you have lost. And we'll be getting into that in a bit. Um, but the, how those things remind you of the meaning of what you feel you've lost. There's a lot of power in symbolism. There's a lot of power in rituals. And having something that connects to that experience is, is really important. Um, it's also important to prioritize self-care and conscientiously and consciously work at not neglecting nourishment, rest, personal hygiene. Those are things that can kind of get left behind a bit in the grieving process. And that's something to be aware of. A next strategy, take it easy, just chill out, take it easy. You know, when it comes down to, you know, how you treat yourself, the, the focus should be easing up and not beating yourself up. Um, for a lot of people, the recovery path is long, not everybody, but for some it is long and pushing too hard too often is the fast track to burnout. Um, when those inner sirens start wailing, you know, the red lights in your brain start flashing, it means it's time to, to slow down. Um, you know, things are overwhelming. It's time to slow down and rest. Um, the best way to reach the finish line in this uh, is sometimes to not move at all for a bit, uh, which seems a little counterintuitive, but it's really powerful just letting the systems recharge so that you can keep going um, because we're not robots. Um, taking breaks, uh, really, it can be the difference between completing or combusting. Uh, and that's, you know, there's a lot of consequences that come with that. Um, 
a special side note for insomnia as well. Um, this is especially relevant for insomnia because it can be so frustrating. But as you get frustrated with yourself, you make it harder. You, you feed the insomnia with, with the tense emotions. So getting back into that mindfulness, getting back into a state of just taking it easy, let things evolve how they will. Don't fight, don't push, just be with the experience and acknowledge that it's something that you don't like, but feeding it anger only makes it worse. Um, so that's just something to be mindful of for anybody who's dealing with insomnia, and that's pretty normal. Um, so putting this into action, um, lean into hobbies. You know, if, if you're not able to do old favorites because of, you know, whatever symptoms you're dealing with, whatever accessibility to things, try to explore some manageable alternatives that are also still somewhat similar. Um, it's especially important, you know, that you learn to modify daily tasks uh, and adjust things so that you're reducing the physical and psychological strain that you might experience. Um, pace yourself, break things down. And to, you know, break, break your tasks and the duties down into smaller pieces and just tackle them over the course of the day. Don't sit there feeling overwhelmed with a mountain of stuff. Just chip away at it. Plan ahead and work towards being able to get smaller pieces done because it's a lot more manageable. It's a lot less stressful. And that's good for healing. Um, practice mindfulness. Again, always the mindfulness. Come, keeps coming back. Um, you know, that could be yoga. That could be artwork. Uh, find time to practice those things. Uh, because they, they do de-escalate a lot of the strain, a lot of the stress, a lot of the tension. Um, it's really great practice is making a daily gratitude list that help you to remember you know, the things that are really important and to focus on the good stuff in life, even if it's tiny. You know, it can be it, it could be the tiniest possible thing. But if there's merit to it and it's a good thing, celebrate it. Um, you know, and that, that ties into nature. Engage with nature in any way that you can. Um, you know, that could be sitting in the sun, that could be taking a walk in the woods or just watching birds through the window. You know, it's it's about connecting with natural life. Um, and for anyone that can, please take a nap whenever you can. Celebrate that. Naps are amazing. Um, so with that, we're going to take a quick humor break. Let's digest that before we move along. Got a couple of those built in. And moving along. So the next one, the next strategy is manage your expectations. Um, I think for people, especially early on in this process, you know, the recovery process, uh, the healing process, uh, it's pretty normal to expect that you can do what you did before because you're the same person, you're the same body, um, and that's pretty normal. But the reality is that we often are not able to function on the exact same levels, um, you know, as far as energy, productivity, you know, compared to what we have expected of ourselves and what other people around us maybe have come to expect of us. Um, challenge yourself. That's great. That's important uh, to making progress. But don't beat yourself up if you can't do something. If you fall short, what you would have done in the past does not make you a failure. It makes you a person in recovery who's healing from one of the hardest experiences that a human can encounter. Um, and that's an important thing to be objectively aware of. Understand that, you know, recovery takes a lot of energy and focus. It's sapping a lot from you. And respect what that process is taking from you because it's huge. It's important. Um, and that you are having to sacrifice some of those things to be able to heal. And you want to try to work with that as much as possible because we want to heal. I think I can speak for everybody on that. Um, that doesn't mean don't try, but try to maintain expectations that are proportional to where you're at in the experience. You're, you've got an injury that you're healing from, and that's something that you need to maintain an awareness of. Um, and ultimately, internalize and burn it into your mind that you are not weak, no matter what you think, no matter what Amy tells you, no matter what anyone tells you. You're dealing with one of the hardest things that a human can experience. That is not a sign of weakness, period. Put that out of your mind. It's, it's, that's, you're lying to yourself if you say I'm weak. It's just not true. Um, so how do we use this? How do we maintain, how do we manage our expectations? One thing to do is celebrate victories. Big ones, small ones, doesn't matter. Just celebrate them for the steps that they are. Um, even if it's a small thing, if you are struggling with agoraphobia and you can barely make it out 
to the sidewalk outside your house. But you managed to take the trash out, celebrate that. Celebrate it. And the people who understand what you're going through want to celebrate that with you uh, because they're the ones that really care about you progressing. And that is progress. Doesn't matter if it, you know, in the outside world, how they look at it, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Celebrate what that is. Um, but also accept the healing takes time and recognize that setbacks are normal. It's just, it's normal. It sucks. It's hard, but we don't do this perfectly. Um, we make mistakes. You know, natural things happen around us that we can't control. Um, we just have to try to keep moving forward. Communicate with people that are relying on you. So if you've got kids uh, or if you have a job and there's people who are expecting things from you, communicate. Communicate thoroughly and with clarity. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but it's important because their expectations um, need to also be realistic. And they need to know what you can realistically achieve. Um, so as part of that, set realistic goals, short term, especially short term goals, um, focus on what you can do uh, and not what you can't do in this moment, because there's lots of things we can't do. And in this situation, there's more that we can't do, but we're still able to do a lot. So, yeah, that kind of goes hand in hand with gratitude. Uh, recognize what you are still able to do and celebrate that. Um, I mean, the reality is, you know, would you run a marathon right after your cast came off if you were a runner? No. Nobody would let you do it, and nobody would try to do it. You would start slow. You'd walk, probably use a physical therapy, then you'd walk, and then you would slowly jog, and then you might start a little bit of a run, and then you'd pick up each day and keep moving forward until you were able to run a marathon. You wouldn't just go cast off to marathon because that's not how it works. Do what you can do when you can do it. Next strategy. Show yourself compassion. Please show yourself compassion. You're not perfect. You're not. You're just not. You're not perfect. None of us have ever been perfect. None of us ever will be perfect. That's okay. That's normal. That's that's life for all of us. Mistakes happen. Um, and that could be anything from missing a dose to a total relapse. Um, and a lot of those things can't just be undone. But the really important part is what you do after that. What comes after those things happen? Um, you know, virtually all of us, every every one of us, I, I virtually everyone, and I can't speak for everybody, but I'm going to say that almost every one of us regrets the path that brought us to benzos. If you are someone who has been on a benzo, you regret the stuff that took you there. Um, or wish, you know, if it's not something to regret, you just wish it hadn't happened. But we can't take that back. And beating yourself up for the past path that took you there does you no good and it actually only harms you and makes your recovery worse. There's no benefit to that. There's a natural part of that grieving process, you know, the the bargaining, the wishing, but sustaining that, fueling that anger towards yourself and beating yourself up, is it's destructive. The reality is the negative self-talk is extremely toxic and it really empowers Amy. You give a lot of fuel to Amy when you talk really negatively and beat yourself up. Um, you know, the, you should be using the same kinds of words that you would use to comfort a friend who is having a really hard time, presuming that we're all good people and not total monsters. Um, most of us, I think, would try to make things better and not make it worse. Um, and that stuff should apply to yourself as much as to anybody around you. Um, ultimately, self-compassion then can reduce shame, it reduces guilt, uh, and then it fosters resilience and enables emotional regulation. And re resilience and emotional regulation are huge, important parts of being able to develop coping skills and ultimately to recover more effectively. Uh, and they serve you a lot better down the line long after recovery from this stuff. So how do we do it? What's the process? Um, you know, one thing is real simple is just be aware of the tones and the words that you use in your self-talk. Um, you know, the, the, if you say something to yourself, you know, stop and think about like, would I be okay hearing someone else say this to a kid or to my grandparent? You know, would I feel comfortable with that? Would that seem okay? And I think a lot of times it probably wouldn't. Again, presuming we're not all a bunch of monsters, which I don't think we are. Um, but check yourself on that. You know, is this is this really an appropriate way to say this? You know, or am I am I putting myself down? Am I being mean to myself? And what am I getting out of that? What's what's the benefit there? Um. I mean, it comes down to treat yourself how you want others. It's the reverse golden rule. Treat yourself how you'd want other people to treat you. 
Um, and a, a big part of this, like I said, we're not perfect. None of us ever have been. It doesn't exist. Sorry, just doesn't. We There are still perfectionists out there. Lots of them. I have some of those tendencies myself. Um, and so a big part of this is to challenge that perfectionism by maintaining, consistently maintaining realistic self-expectations. Um, you know, there's some ways to do it, like writing down your goals with an action plan and then objectively critique it or sit down with someone else and have them critique it with you in a constructive way. Um, you can work towards conscientiously forgiving yourself. And again, doing that out loud is best um, because you deserve to hear it. You deserve to say it. You deserve to hear it. Um, even if it's you saying it, that's still powerful. Uh, you, you know, seek support. Seek, you know, seek out the people that naturally have encouraged you or who you know have the potential to encourage you through the process. People that you trust. Um, seek them out and try to make those connections. Uh, practice self-compassion exercises. You can write yourself a compassionate letter. Um, these things are actually surprisingly powerful. We may doubt it just hearing it, but they they can be surprisingly powerful. You can write yourself a compassionate letter, or you can practice loving kindness meditations. Um, just ultimately give yourself grace. You know, you're going through a lot or you have been through a lot. You deserve to give yourself grace. Just like you would maybe want it from somebody else. Why would you not give it to yourself? An important strategy. And with that, we'll move on to the next one. Externalize the struggle. Holding in emotions like fear, anxiety, anger uh, allows pressure to build, and that's Amy fuel. That, that just feeds Amy. The anger, the festering stuff in there, the rage. You know, those are not healthy things to hold on to. Uh, in the same way that holding on to trauma results in PTSD. It's because you it bottles up and it's not being dealt with. So keeping that stuff inside, or at least trying to keep it inside, um, ultimately promotes isolation, which is the polar opposite of anything conducive to healing. Isolation is not how we function. Um, you know, internalization of, of you know the, the different struggles that you're having fosters uh, inner chaos, it feeds ruminations, and those then perpetuate catastrophic thinking. In contrast, externalizing creates space between yourself and the struggle and uh, allows a degree of relief. Um, it, venting that inner mess reduces the internal toxicity overall and opens that space for healing opportunities. Um, looking at, you know, especially like if, you, if you're writing things out, looking at crisis material outside of yourself when it was previously inside of yourself gives you um, much stronger objective awareness and much clearer perceptions. Um, and ultimately, Cathartic expression is extremely powerful. Um, you know, those are those are the, the the cathartic experience are the ones that channel your emotions and really like hit that emotion release switch real hard. Um, those are powerful um, and and worth looking at. Um, so, what kinds of things can we do? Um, therapy and counseling. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, everybody should be doing it, including therapists and counselors. Um, you know, if you can do it every week, that's preferable. Everybody should be doing therapy. I'm a little biased. Um, that's fair. Um, you know, another great approach is daily or daily or otherwise regular journaling. Um, some people are not good at daily, but if they do it every weekend or you know, every Tuesday afternoon, whatever, but the consistency is the important part. It's, a, it's an opportunity that you can rely on, on a regular basis to express things. Um, one thing that I found effective at times is stream of consciousness writing, especially when you're in a spiral or you know, in a really challenging place, just a, 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 an explosion of words. They don't, you, they don't have to make sense. You can make words up. You don't need punctuation. The grammar doesn't matter. Just let it flow. Let it, let it just explode on the paper and just let it, let it be. Let the, let the torrent out. Uh, there's a lot of power in that. Um, and it's really, interesting to later on be able to go look at what you wrote and to be more objective in thinking about how that experience made you feel. And it's, it's powerful. Um, exercise, again, exercise, um, you know, and not too intense, but some exercise is important. Um, any kind of artistic expression really, um, and other kinds of creative outlets, there's, there's the inherent connection between art and emotion and externalizing that stuff through 
any kind of art that matters to you, or even if you're not good at it, it doesn't matter, screw it, just do it. Um, try new things. Um, you know, talk to people that you trust, connect with people. Um, that could be individuals or that could be a support group, but connect with humans uh, and talk about what you're going through um, and be a source that other people can talk to about their experiences too. Um, one of my favorites is a rage room. I don't know if y'all are familiar with rage rooms, but it's pretty fantastic. Um, you know, just basically think smashing a bunch of bottles with a baseball bat or a TV with a crowbar. It's really, you know, when I talked about catharsis, the cathartic experiences, that is a very good cathartic experience. You let out a whole lot of anger, a lot of frustration. You could pay people to do that, or you could do it at home. If you're going to do it at home, please be careful. Clean up your mess, do it in a safe place, wear safety gear, don't be irresponsible about it, but it is cheaper that way. Um, it's pretty fantastic, though. If, you have, if you're not familiar, see if there's one in your area, 20 bucks is worth it. Um, and, you know, for, for those who, who do that, pray. Uh, whatever deities, gods, goddesses, singular, plural, whatever, or forces that you believe in is not the relevant point. It doesn't even have to be a defined thing. Um, but the key part of that is venting through communication with something, some something that can receive that. Uh, and if you believe in something that can receive that, or even if you're just screaming at the sky, because the stars might hear you, there's power in that. That's something that's worth doing every now and then. Next strategy. Don't do it alone. We we talked a little bit about that. We are we don't do well in isolation. We don't. Um, you know, holding in emotions. Um, no, I'm on the wrong slide there. <laughs> there we go. Um, so yeah, uninjured humans. Um, don't thrive in isolation. So the people that are injured or are in the process of tapering, withdrawal, uh, especially if they're trying to do those things in secret, are, are risking a lot. Um, you know, the stigma around recovery is, is ugly. Um, but, you know, nobody should be trying to do this alone. Um, it, there's there, no stigma is worth trying to face this in isolation. Um, vulnerability is hard. Um, you know, a lot of people struggle with being vulnerable, but it's really an important way to show trust and to let other people be trusted and to be able to allow yourself that space to heal. Um, you know, to be able to facilitate that kind of trust, it's important that you start trying to work towards building a support network early on. Ideally, if you're tapering, start that while you're tapering. Or if you can, start before you're tapering. Communicate with the people around you about what you think you might be going through. Try to educate them. Um, but the sooner you can do that, the more you have to rely on. Um, and uh, the more transparent that you can be, the better, because that's more help that you're able to get access to when you need it. Um, instead of trying to like pretend that everything's okay and like, oh, I'm doing fine, even though I'm totally not, nobody's going to offer you the resources if they don't think you need them. Uh, and when you do need them, you know you need them. Um, and even if you live alone, just let some people in on your journey and be real with those people. Um, you know, that could be neighbor that you hang out with sometimes. That could be a coworker that you're close to. It could be a sibling, it could be anybody. It could be somebody that you randomly met on AOL 20 years ago that you still chat with or somebody that you play Scrabble with on the other side of the world online. Connect with them if there's somebody that has some kind of a personal connection with you. Um, you know, but at the same time, be aware of the risks of vicarious trauma and burnout um, because if you put all of your stuff on one person, that's a lot of a lot of weight for them to carry, um, especially if they don't want to be letting that back out on you. Um, so that's part of the benefit of having a few people that you can connect with. Um, and then also the people that are consistently supporting you the most of the process, strongly encourage them to pursue therapy too, uh, because that's really important, you know, that they're not going to be much good to you or themselves if they burn out. And that's a strong setup for resentment. So if they can be getting help in the process, it's definitely beneficial. Um, so how do we do this? Um, well, one thing to do is try to choose the right people. And the right people is a bit of a sensitive topic, you know, because that's hard to define. But you kind of know the people that are not the right people. 
Um, like the people that you know are, are, you know, throwing the stigma out there real hard. Um, those are not the people that you want to be connecting with. Maybe down the road so you can maybe help teach them a lesson on some level. But those are not the people that you want to be supporting you because they're not reliable in that. Find the people that you know are the right people for you. Um, you know, find the people that you trust that will stick with you for the journey. Um, educate yourself a lot about what your needs are going to look like and then use that knowledge to help other people learn more about the realities of what you're experiencing, what other people in this situation experience. Um, and be honest with the people that care about you. Don't lie to the people that care about you. Be real with them. Um, you know, so many people I've talked to in the support group are like, I don't, I don't talk about this thing because I don't want to hurt people. I don't want them to worry. But the reality is when you challenge that and you say, do you think those people really want you to be secretive? Do you, do you think that those people would rather know and have the opportunity to support someone they care about or to find out down the road that somebody was struggling a lot and there was something that could have been done, but wasn't. Every time you, the people want to know about it, don't don't hide the, the struggle. Be honest with people, um, you know, but also at the same time, learn in that process what other people's limits and boundaries are, um, because if you keep crossing those too much, then you end up risking burnout for them um, and respect what those boundaries are. Um, similarly, be specific in your own needs. Be clear about what you need um, and don't don't force the people that are supporting you to like guess or presume what they think maybe you need. Just be upfront, be clear, be transparent. Um, and also be patient, you know, work at li listening actively um, and encourage open communication so that they can be real with you too. Because it's, you know, especially if it's somebody you live with, it's gonna, it can be really hard for them. They need to be heard. They need to be validated. They need to be able to be real um, for this to stay balanced. Um, and, you know, let them celebrate with you. Let, even again, those tiny things, man, I made it out to the trash can. Celebrate that. Celebrate it with the people that care about you. Let them enjoy your growth and your healing process. Um, and ultimately, if you can, find a support group. There's so many out there, you know, whether it's in person, whether it's online, there are tons of them online. You know, it could be AA, it could be NA. Just find some people that are, are relatable on some level and tap into that. All right, next one. Next strategy is to sharpen your coping tools. There are a ton of de-escalation, grounding, other kinds of coping tools that are out there that will, can be really powerful assets in recovery. Um, the more coping tools that you have, the less control Amy has. Uh, that's a really important thing because there are a lot of them out there and you could take a lot of that control away from Amy. That's good for you. Um, you know, coping tools are kind of like martial arts moves. Um, the more that you practice, the more you're better able to dodge Amy's attacks. You're able to predict where something's going to go. It takes a lot of that power away and, and makes you the master of that situation. Um, coping tools also then build resilience, which is, you know, our, our ability to bounce back. Uh, and that's, that's a really important part of overcoming crisis and setbacks in this process, but then also largely for life. That's stuff that'll stay with you. Um, and then as your coping tool collection grows, your self-confidence grows, self-efficacy grows, self-awareness grows. Those are, again, things that will serve you for life. Um, you know, there's a, I want to make a special special point then about, um, you know, people who have a more addictive relationship to, to benzos or to other substances. Um, you know, these, these tools are really important elements in preventing relapse. Um, they strengthen the relationships that you're in. They facilitate stronger social support. And that's a really important protective factor against relapse and self-harm. So special note, if you are someone who, you know, has a tendency to abuse medications, um, these are extra important. They're important for everybody, but some of those risk factors are higher for people with addictive patterns, and these can make a huge life-changing difference. Um, you know, again, as I said, these, these tools foster recovery long, long and far beyond benzos into other situations, you know, through life. Um, so how do we do it? How do we connect with these things? Um, 
you know, identify and be mindful of um, you know, different symptom triggers, um, practice mindfulness skills like meditation and art, practice grounding skills like body scanning, um, practice problem solving skills, you know, that's weighing pros and cons, brainstorming solutions, using action plans, uh, be aware of cognitive distortions and their antidotes. Those can really create a lot of toxicity. Um, develop healthy habits relating to like eating, sleeping, um, and exercise. Uh, learn stress management methods like yoga, progressive muscle relaxation, guided imagery. Um, pursue skills therapies, uh, so like cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. Acceptance commitment therapy is one of the personal therapies. Um, and then also explore new hobbies and positive distractions, things that'll keep manifesting positive results. Humor break. Chew on that for a second. We're moving towards the end. That's pretty relatable to me. I don't know about anybody else, but I saw that and I was like, yep, I get that. All right, next strategy. Be your own biggest advocate. Um, a lot of people end up, you know, in their benzo saga um, or other kinds of psychiatric med sagas, uh, having presumed that someone like a psychiatrist or a doctor knew what was best and safest for them. A lot of us find out that maybe it wasn't so accurate. Um, now we know that we need to be doing our own research, um, but we also then need to be assertive with the things that we learn. Um, so that means not just assuming that anyone knows what you want, need, or think, it's on you to communicate with clarity. Um, you're thinking out the resources and the support services for yourself. If you have help, that's outstanding. Collaborate with people. You know, take that help. But <clears throat> also learn to be doing a lot of this stuff for yourself um, because it's a really important aspect of growing through the process. Um, that also includes setting boundaries, identify your boundaries, communicate your boundaries, and stand your ground when you need to. There are times for compromise, there are times for negotiation, but there are times where no one else is gonna stand the ground for you and it's on you to do that. And there can be big implications. Um, so that's an important thing to be able to learn to do. Um, self-advocacy then helps to build self-confidence, self self-empowerment, um, and self-accountability. Those are really, really important life skills. Uh, and qualities of being. And ultimately, you got to be at the center of your own recovery. You have to own it. It's not anybody else's recovery. It's yours. And no one's going to fix things for you. No one's going to make it happen. It's on you to own your recovery. So how do we do it? Um, you know, know, know your rights and assert them when it's appropriate in a given context. Um, and do that with confidence. Uh, be informed in advance. So learn what you can beforehand. Be informed in advance about the intersection of best practices and what available options there are or alternatives. Um, take the time to identify your needs and your goals and you know why those are important to your recovery so that you can take ownership of that. Educate yourself and don't presume anyone else is gonna know what's best, but also be mindful of resources. Just because you found it on Wikipedia doesn't mean that it's necessarily reliable. Um, track the resources, learn, learn how to differentiate what is reliable information and what's not, even though that remains relative. Some things are just a lot less reliable. Um, you know, develop assertive communication skills. Uh, so like setting boundaries, using I statements, um, practice uh, expressing your needs with clarity and respect. Um, because, you know, I think a lot of people feel like they can do it, but they don't know how to do it with the respect angle. But you can be assertive and polite at the same time, it turns out. Uh, and that can really serve you well, because if people feel respected, uh, that can make a big difference. Um, practice goal setting, use action plans, uh, and then practice self-reflection and validate your, your own strengths. You know, own your stuff, the good stuff and the bad stuff. All right, next strategy. Ask for the help that you need. Um, Everybody needs help now and then. If you say that you don't, you're lying to yourself, you're lying to everybody else. Everybody needs help every now and then. Uh, it's a simple fact of life. Um, so what can be challenging is setting the ego aside. And that can be hard to make it, that can make it hard to ask for help and to exceed, receive the help that you've already asked for. 
Um, so setting that aside is hard, but it's a lot less agonizing than suffering in ways that would have been totally avoidable because of pride and hubris. Um, yeah, self-efficacy is a really important part of adulting, um, <clears throat> but it's also important to be able to know when it's time to ask for help from people that care about you uh, and to show humility. Your support system can offer a ton of encouragement, you know, companies, you know, just being in person with you, um, validation, practical help, but it really oftentimes needs to be asked for um, or established on some level and not just just expected for somebody to figure it out. Um, you know, and seeking help fosters accountability and growth, and those are important. Being assertive with needs can help prevent relapse, detox crises, uh, and then can provide access to resources, which are huge critical factors in recovery. Um, so I'm going to tread into a slightly uh, controversial one here, but I think it's it warrants recognition on, on a pragmatic level. Um, in the rare case that things are really desperate, and I think most know what I mean when I say really desperate, um, get the help that you need to resolve those issues. Uh, and it's controversial, but uh, it's worth having a conversation about uh, helper meds uh, as an option when you're looking at a life and death situation. Um, just make sure that you're informed in the process. There are some people that have very strong views against or in favor of um, helper meds, and they are entitled to those opinions. From a pragmatic point of view, though, it, it can be a life-saving thing for some people. Uh, it's just important that people go into that situation well-informed and aware of what risks they may be looking at. Um, I know from having worked in the group situation, uh, you know, the support group, there are people who would not be with us today were it not for something like pre -applet. It's something they are not pleased with doing, they're not pleased with taking, but it was the thing that kept them alive. Um, so in those situations, it's a conversation worth having when it's that or nothing. Um, and I just think that's worth noting. So how do we how do we actually, you know, manifest asking for help in a productive way as a strategy? Um, you know, turn to your support people, um, you know, your friends, your family, the people that we've been, we've been discussing so far. When you need them, turn to them. Just, again, be mindful of what some of the limits may be. Um, some people can call their mom at four o'clock in the morning, like me. I was lucky. <laughs> a lot of people can't do that. And if you keep doing it, you may burn out your welcome. So just be aware of some of those limits. I didn't burn out my welcome. Mom's great. Um, hi, Mom. Pursue therapy or counseling as soon as you possibly can. Um, you know, ideally, again, on a weekly basis. I know people that are doing it two times a week, and most of them are loving it. Um, try to get that support when you can so that you. it's just best. It just makes sense to pay someone to take the stuff from you instead of expecting someone who cares about you to do it for no money. The person that's getting paid for it is going to keep tolerating it a lot more than anybody else. Uh, and there's a good relationship there. And you can usually get a lot of help and wisdom. That's a really important thing. So if you can get that kind of support, please do. Um, you know, if you can't do that, seek out support groups. Or if you can do that, still seek out support groups. Um, there's, you know, there, obviously there's groups on Facebook. Um, you know, we've got a group on Reddit. There's other individual groups. There's NA, there's AA. You know, there's virtual, there's in-person. Tap into those. They're around, they exist. You know, we have this incredible communication capacity in our hands all the time, all over the world. So it's, it is accessible. Um, you know, and if nothing else, use hotlines and helplines if you can't actually connect with anybody else. There's an international directory that has hotlines for the entire world, all different countries, you know, texting lines. You can get access to people pretty quickly in a crisis um, if you can't connect with people that are your direct support people. Um, you know, like I said, there's a there's myriad online recovery resources. I cannot say this enough. Do not Google your symptoms ever. Not ever. It is always a bad idea. Do not Google your symptoms. Worst case, ask a friend to Google it. Someone else that is not you, because that is a dark, really heavy spiral like 
every time. And most of us have done it and it regretted it so hard. I can't say it enough. Don't go get your symptoms ever. Um, another great approach is to listen to or read self-help books or audio books, um, you know, just to get a better sense of what your capacities are and when maybe to get a clearer sense of when you could be reaching out to other people for help. Um, as a last resort, uh, detox and rehab, they have a reputation for this uh, this kind of situation. Benzo recovery in particular is not generally a good scene, but if it's that or, you know, cold turkey and you could get a two-week taper versus no taper, that's an option to look into too. Um, one to definitely weigh pros and cons with them. Okay, and the next strategy. Promise, we're almost there. Um, don't act or react in desperation. Um, if you know Amy through Ben's recovery, which if you're in recovery, you do, uh, then you're already somewhat familiar, at least with the you know the five Fs uh, of fear response. You know, fight, flight, freeze, flop, and depending on where you are in the world, uh, fawn or friend. Um, Amy feeds on the panic and the fear that then triggers temporary but counterproductive relief-seeking behaviors oftentimes. Uh, that desperation from panic or symptom fatigue then raises your stress, it lowers rationality, and it lowers your coping capacities uh, and decision-making. Uh, desperate behaviors then, uh, you know, desperate behaviors then increase uh, risk of relapse, uh, risk of secondary substance use, and potential self-harm. Um, these kinds of behaviors then can ultimately undermine progress, lower self-esteem, and negatively impact your support relationships. Um, and that you know, that desperation then breeds unhealthy coping mechanisms and that ultimately in turn can then interfere with helpful treatments and different therapeutic processes that you may be succeeding with already. So how do you get about that? Um, practice mindfulness. Once again, practice your mindfulness techniques and then in that process, develop awareness of your personal fear and anxiety triggers. Um, make use of the many coping tools, uh, healthy coping tools um, that you inevitably will soon have after this session because you're all going to hunt them down. I know that. Um, you know, and that includes stuff like CBT skills. This could be really, really helpful for navigating some of those challenges. Uh, lean on your support team. Again, individuals and groups get get help organizing something like a, a check-in system so that you're not just kind of left floating for long periods of time because nobody checked in. Um, develop a relapse prevention plan if that's something that you're at risk for. You know, use your do that with your close support network, uh, you know, or, or ideally a therapist and prescriber as well. Um, develop a reliable emergency crisis plan. That's good for everybody to have. Uh, my background's in disaster management. Everybody should have a crisis plan. Um, have that and include important contacts, addresses, and, you know, fast track coping tips. Um, maintain strong, consistent self-care regimen, you know, so that you're not letting yourself get pulled down by the experience, um, you know. An occasional shower serves everybody pretty well. Um, employ positive, healthy distraction uh, methods. And, um, you know, again, if it is necessary, really necessary to use helper meds, do not suddenly escalate your use or suddenly stop because you're frustrated. That can have very unintended consequences that can make your recovery way more complicated and last a lot longer. If you have taken the steps out of necessity to use helper meds, use them right. Don't be rash about that. There are too many people that have paid a price for that. Um, through this process, stay true to your core self. And that, this is a challenging one for a lot of people. Um, it's totally normal to feel like you're completely disconnected from your past self especially as you get deeper into the recovery process. Um, and that can be really scary and be really sad for a lot of people. Um, you know, experiences, common symptoms like depersonalization, derealization are really, really common. Um, and they are universally hated, but ultimately they will pass. Your experience with depersonalization is not your current and forever state of being. It will pass. Despite what Amy tells you, uh, whatever Amy tells you, your core self is still inside of you. All those values, the strengths, the loves, the passions, the ideals, that stuff is still locked inside of you in a secure place that virtually nothing can take away. 
you may feel disconnected from it. You may feel like you're not able to get access to it, but it is still there. And it'll come back and open up when the time is right. So feeling a lack of joy, this is another really huge one for a lot of people. Feeling a lack of joy when you know there should be joy, like a kid, you know, your kid's birthday party. You know you should be feeling that it's just not there. And that's heartbreaking. It's brutally hard because you 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 know that's that's when you feel like you're really missing the things of life in those moments remind yourself that the joy that you should ideally be feeling that joy is still being imprinted in your emotion your your emotional memories so down the road when you look at a photograph or you have something that triggers that thought and you think back to that party, you're you're going to see that the joy that was there, that joy is actually still going to be accessible. It's just, it sucks because you're not able to really enjoy it in the moment, but it's still being imprinted. It's still being put there. You're not going to look back on that and only think about the pain, the suffering that you felt. You will find the joy. It's not lost. It's not gone forever. It's just delayed gratification, but it's still there. Um, so how do you connect with that? Um, how do you use it? Take time to reflect, uh, reflect on, and then write about, um, or otherwise, write or otherwise creatively express values, your your deepest values, beliefs, goals, um, the things that are those unique features that make you the real you. Uh, remain authentic, but you know, stay stay honest and genuine with people, and when you interact with them, um, don't try to pretend to be somebody that you're not because you. You know, don't want them to see how, how much you're struggling. Be you. Be real. Because that's the key part of staying true to yourself and, you know, having that connection. Listen to your intuition. Trust your inner wisdom to guide you in the decision making that really aligns with your core. Practice self-compassion and mindful self-awareness. Uh, keep connecting to the things that you previously found enjoyable and fulfilling. Um, it's worth it when you're actually healed and can dive back in. And the last of the strategies, I commend you for making it all this way with me. It's a lot of strategies. Um, find meaning in the suffering. This is a hard one, um, but I, to me, this I think is one of the most important ones. This is what has kept me working in a support group every two weeks, every, <laughs> every week for two years. Um, and keeps me involved while I have a lot of other things going on is because I found a lot of meaning in that experience. Um, it's it's possible and probable that Benza recovery uh, will be the worst thing you'll experience. Um, that may not be true for everybody. A lot of people heal very smoothly. For the people that don't, this is probably going to be the apex of misery. Um, and no one can say how long it's going to take. No one can say, you know, what that's going to look like. But searching for meaning in that process actively fosters resilience. Uh, it enables growth. It provides a sense of purpose and it deepens connections uh, to the world around you, the people around you. And those things ultimately actively and directly promote healing. Um, I had to include one of my favorite quotes about the meaning of suffering. Um, <clears throat> by Viktor Frankl, a uh, psychotherapist and a survivor of alcohol. said this about the meaning of suffering. We must never forget that we may also find meaning in life even when confronted with a hopeless situation, when facing a fate that cannot be changed. For what then matters is to bear witness to the uniquely human potential at its best, which is to transform a personal tragedy, tragedy into a triumph to turn one's predicament into a human achievement. That's from his book, Man's Search for Meaning. It's fantastic, fantastic, fantastic book. Um, so how do we actually try to make these things happen? Um, take the time to reflect on the challenges that have been faced within the withdrawal experience and uh, in, the, in the recovery experience and examine how those things can ultimately make you a stronger person, how they have and in the future can make you a stronger person. Look for the lessons and insights that can be gained from the pain and suffering you've endured. It's there. You have to look for it. Uh, but what have they taught you? What what have they and can they teach you about yourself, about others, and about the world, the larger world in a time of crisis? 
um, re-examine your core values through the lens of what you're experiencing. Um, explore how your suffering can contribute to a greater sense of purpose in your life and how your experience can then make the world a better place. Um, let your suffering also be a catalyst for the healing guidance of others who are navigating their own pathways to this pain. Thank you for walking on this strategic journey with me. Uh, the final slide reflects the research work that I'm currently doing. Um, get it to pop up here, come on now. Um, this is, I'm working on a study that's exploring the link between pre-benzo trauma and post-benzo pause or bind. Um, we're in the process, we're looking to get about 1,250 participants to complete the 10 to 15 minute survey. We're well on our way into that, but we still have a ways to go. Um, so anybody for whom this applies, or if you know anyone to whom it applies, uh, great if it could be passed along, you can scan the QR code. Uh, you can also um, reach out on Facebook and ask for a link. There's a few places where it's been posted, um, but I will allow you to read this at your own leisure. Um, and then I think we're going to take a break for a little bit and then we're going to come back together and talk about stuff. That'd be great. Jake, thank you so much. It was like such a wealth of coping strategies that you shared and so well organized, like hugely helpful. So um, thank you for that. And I want to encourage everyone here to participate in that study. If you haven't already, do the survey. It's easy. <laughs> it's easy. It's painless um, and it will help. And goodness knows we need to know more about how projected withdrawal happens in the first place. So um, help us out, help Jake out. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording here and we're gonna just take a quick break. Um, I'll be here, Lisa will be here. Um, but we're just gonna take a few minutes and give Jake, a, give Jake a time, a chance to breathe. And then we're gonna come back and we will have a conversation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jake.